Yeah. All right. Cool. I want to welcome you all back from uh, spring break. Hope you enjoyed the, uh, the last meeting. It was great. Uh, we got some awesome content for you all today and for the rest of the semester, but it's uh, going to be kind of a doozy this time around. So once again, if you haven't gotten a chance to sign in, you're going to want to because uh, elections are coming up soon. And if you don't have uh, active student membership, then you won't be able to vote. You won't be able to run. Cool. All right, so uh, today's topics, we're going to go over some announcements like always. We got current events with Jackson, uh, where they're now with Carlos Beltran. Uh, we got main event vulnerability research uh, with uh, Man with the Dream, otherwise known as Chris Fisher. Uh, we've also got tool time, uh, which is going after the main event this time. We're going to get into some stuff about crafting CTF challenges with Jeffrey. Then we're going to do some closing. All right. So on the announcements, this is what we're going to go over. As you can uh, see by reading ahead, we got some really awesome news. Uh, not too long ago, but we'll get to that in a minute. We are now officially a uh, nonprofit. So. Yeah. Like uh, like three years in the making, but we finally uh, made it. Uh, I think the IRS just like read the meet, uh, read their mail this time around, but uh, we got it back. We're posted to February, so we do have to file taxes now, unfortunately. But that also means a lot of other things. Uh, sponsorships now go directly to us instead of going to another foundation that we have to ask for money from. Um, we won't have so many hassles with getting access to our own bank account when we do transfer of students and follow-ons and things like that afterwards are gonna be a lot easier now. So great stuff, looking forward to a, a lot of really awesome stuff coming down the pipe. All right, getting into CTFs coming up. We got a lot of them. Uh, we're gonna go over what's coming up in this month as well as next month, because it's gonna move fast. Uh, we got Pico CTF. This one goes on for quite a while uh, from March 15th, which has already started all the way to March 29th. If you haven't done a CTF before, this is your chance. Pico is a great place to start. Um, it's also a great place to sharpen your skills and or like move into another area of CTF that you haven't done a lot of stuff before. Also, just putting it out there, if you're looking to uh, gain some teammates, if you want to start getting into uh, CTFing more competitively, you want to start working with people, Pico is a great place to get together new challenges uh, cooperatively. If you haven't done that yet, it's a, it's a great place to start. You can do teams of up to four people, free to register, free to compete, uh, crypto, reverse engineering, binary exploitation, all kinds of stuff. This is a great one. They've even got all the previous years up. So if you run out of challenges, I don't know how you would, but if you do, you can do those. Wicked Six. All right, so this is coming up really quickly. And uh, I think I might've advised some people in the past that this was a team competition and I wanna take a moment to step back and say it is not, at least as far as what I can tell from the website. This is an individual competition that you can like probably compete together with, but it is coming up, uh, I think March 23rd and March 24th. Yeah. So uh, going to be a really awesome uh, setup. This is the first time that they've run Wicked Six since 2019. Uh, due to COVID and whatnot, it's all virtual. Uh, we've been talking about it. You if you have a chance to check us out, you definitely should. NCL is coming up yet again. They've been doing these uh, way more frequently than what they have in the past. And even so, it is definitely worth your time. Uh, this one is uh, a pay to play kind of game. It is a $35 entry fee, but that does include a gym. It includes an individual portion where you'll be ranked as well as a team portion, which you will also be ranked. Uh, if you've never done NCL, you definitely should. If you've done it before, it might not be a bad idea to try it again, but a lot of these challenges tend to be a lot of the same thing you've seen before. Uh, but it is uh, fantastic training. They do a lot of uh, video calls where they walk you through challenge creation from the past, how they went about it. Um, a lot of people that are top ranked end up coming back as mentors. Uh, there's a lot of like really good stuff here. You can do teams of up to seven people. Um, I've done this in the past. I, I think it's really good. March uh, 29th is the closing date for registration though. If you don't get in by then, you won't be able to. Um, so yeah, we, I don't think that we're going to be doing a scholarship for this NCL though. So you have to come up with that cost yourself. Space Heroes. Uh, I honestly do not know a whole lot about this. Uh, April 1st through April 3rd. Um, FITSEC from Florida Tech is putting this on. Uh, I've never done this one personally before, so it should be uh, a good time, hopefully, um, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, Jersey CTF number two, um, April 9th through the 10th, teams of up to four people. I also have never done this one, so I can't really speak to it, um, and I have not heard a lot about it, but I have uh, heard some people that are very excited about it, but they are from Jersey, so take that for <laughs> what you will. All right. Uh, Hack UCF executive nominations are open. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in depth. Um, 
I think I've actually done this. No, this is a this is a new slide. So if you know anyone that you think would be a good fit to run this club, nominate them. They can refuse, right? You're not going to get anyone in trouble for nominating them. You're not going to get in trouble for nominating yourself. If you nominate someone and they can't run, that's okay. It just happens. But if you don't nominate anyone and no one nominates themselves, we won't have an executive board. And that's going to be a problem because I'm not going to be here to run this club. Um, you can nominate by name or by Discord handle. Um, you can use this QR code right here to go ahead and jump to a Google form, drop their name and a position you want to elect them for. You can submit as many times as you want. Spam that if you'd like to. Um, nominations close next Friday at midnight. So keep that in mind. You have less than, uh, well, just a, a little bit over a week to get in if you're going to get in. Going over the duties of president, uh, your responsibility is to steer the ship, basically. Uh, I've got this whole board of things that I'm not going to read through because that's going to take forever. If you want to take a look at this in detail, that QR code goes to um, the form, but you can go to, you can get the constitution, which talks about this in depth at hackucf.org slash constitution. Um, you're responsible for making sure that the meetings happen every single week, making sure that everyone that is going to do something has the, cap has the capacity to do that. Um, you're unblocking people and you're, you're kind of making sure that everything happens. Uh, you'll be overloaded and it's a lot of work, but it is also a lot of fun. You get enabled to do a lot of really cool things. Um, you help make the best stuff happen. So this is uh, obviously my position. Um, I've seen a lot of really great presidents and I look forward to seeing whoever it is that follows me do better than I have. Jeffrey, you wanna come up here and talk about being vice president? Sure thing. So vice president is pretty much the right hand man to the president. Um, they do everything that um, maybe if there's an exec missing, they kind of fill in all the gaps if there are any, um, coordinating um, any like um, like um, official conferences, but Daniel's mostly been handling the um, DEF CON stuff. But um, also uh, um, I'm in charge of making sure like all the positions are audited, are doing their job and are doing their job correctly. And as per, um, the Constitution, um, as well as assisting in special presidents assigned by the president, as well as helping the turnover um, for um, the vice president position, which all the positions have to do. Um, Matt, do you want to talk about treasurer? Sure. So, treasurer, that's me. Uh, Calling Mr. Money. Um, I basically deal with all the t uh, club's financial matters. Um, whether it be uh, setting up 501c3, uh, receiving membership dues, determining membership status, stuff like that. Um, you see here, all the fun things I have to do is my responsibilities. Um, but yeah, basically I do like all the taxes, anything to do with money is what I'll do. Um, or what you guys will do if you want for treasurer. Um, but yeah, um, and anything that the our president or vice president wants me to do, I also have to do that as well. Um, it's kind of how it works. So basically a good summary. Uh, any questions? No? Yes. So are you like the Mr. Krabs of IQTF? He's actually a good person now. Are you saying Mr. Krabs is a good person? Yes. <laughs> Call, uh, I'm like the Federal Reserve of Hack UCF. That's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. And um, secretary. So the secretary, um, that was my position last year, um, pretty much in charge of um, at, the equivalent of at everyone on Discord, but also on email and maybe Twitter and maybe LinkedIn. So on top of that, um, note taking, um, as well as like being able to um, facilitating contact with alumni and preparing the um, boring stuff like ballots for elections and whatnot, as well as, of course, assisting in projects assigned by the um, president and the vice president. Also worth noting that secretary and treasurer are about equal in like power. Um, there's like not really that strict hierarchy in the executive board. Generally, everyone, even ops, just helps to run the club. And these four positions are the quintessential to make sure we're able to get by our day to days. So yeah, um, this is how you're going to nominate someone. Um, you can either um, go to the form or you can go to um, email execs at hackucf.org. Same process, send a name, send a discord, send a UCF ID maybe. Um, not everyone is gonna be qualified to run. Like some people might not 
meet the credit hour requirement that we have. You have to be at least part time and you might not like have the grades, but as long as I think it's a 2.5 you have to be above, um, you should be, it's three. No, I was gonna say, um, I have some of that information. Yeah, yeah so the um, guy over there um, in the blue mask, um, if you have any questions about the nitty gritty requirements that hopefully everyone I believe in this room is probably qualified for, you can ask him. But um, most importantly, you have to have attended at least 50% of the meetings these last two semesters. That is, you're an active student member. Um, nominations close um, in about a week. So please like nominate someone. I have the list of people who've um, so far been nominated. It's an empty text file. I, we got our five, one, two, three, like three days ago. I do not want to dissolve the club. Um, so yeah, um, if you're interested in help um, keeping the club going from year to year, um, either nominate someone or um, nominate yourself. And you have something you want to say? Yeah, I just want to talk about um, the eligibility requirements. It's, like, it's kind of vague. Um, I actually checked the constitution just before I came here. Awesome. You, you do one, you need to be a dues paying member. So if you're planning to run, pay your $10 dues. Two, uh, you were slightly incorrect on that. The actual way the constitution's reading, if you need to have attended 50% of the meetings this current semester. It is this current semester, yes. it's not both. Okay, yes. I am sorry about that. So if you just join this semester, you can still- it, it is both. Section, Article 4, Section 2, potential officers must have been an active student member for at least two consecutive semesters, including the semester of the nomination. Okay. Okay. So that can be waived by a vote if needed, but- there was a section about the semester only that was in the Constitution. So, so Article 4, Section 1 is eligibility, and then Article 4, Section 2 is additional eligibility criteria. Okay. Okay, so that's the Constitution. So then there's the Golden Rules pieces. Those are the ones that say, if you're an undergraduate, you need to be enrolled at least half time. So that's six credit hours. If you're a graduate student running for office, you need to be enrolled for five hours. Uh, with one exception, if you are a graduate student who is dissertation only, which means you're done with everything and you're just doing your dissertation, uh, you only have to be enrolled for three credit hours. I don't have too many graduate students running through this stuff, but um, there's all that. Uh, also, if it is your very last semester um, and you'll be graduating at the end of it, you do not need to meet that requirement. If you only need three more hours to graduate, uh, that, that will suffice. And the GPA is 2.5 for um, undergraduate and 3.0 for graduate students. If you don't know about grad school, you have to maintain a 3.0, so you get kicked out. So, um, that is pretty much on the eligibility requirements. Is anybody clear on that? Um, also, when you, you need to nominate yourself or anybody else, um, we will check the eligibility requirements right before the election. So you have to meet these requirements now, and you also have to meet them when we come back in the fall. So if you have a bad summer or a bad, like I'm gonna check them now, it's based on your winter grades. Um, so if you have a bad spring or a bad summer and your GPA goes down or whatever, uh, you won't be assuming your role and still comes back. That hasn't happened to anybody yet, but just be aware of that. Yeah, and final notes, um, there are some classes for um, mainly the attendance requirement for hack on the hack UCF side, we can waive. So if you are like on the fence, you don't know you're gonna qualify, just talk to an exec, we can kind of work things out. Um, we'd rather have um, someone like just barely meet the requirements than um, like no one at all. So yeah, um, from our friends at Cyber Florida, um, we've been pushing this for a few weeks now. Um, it's a podcast from pretty much USF cyber um, department and they bring in like kind of guests in the cybersecurity industry for a more slice of life approach um, on like, so, if you're kind of like into that, this might be a good podcast for you. They've had a bunch of cool people, Richard, um, Rachel Tolback, um, Roger Grimes, Shane Young. If any of those names are um, interesting to you, uh, check out the podcast. Um, uh, it's on all major like podcast services, iTunes, Spotify, I'm pretty sure, um, and their website. Now, um, an alumni um, of Hack UCF um, have reached out to us and wanted to um, push this research survey. So if you would like to um, help like potentially um, provide data for a potential upcoming project that they're working on, um, please feel free to scan this nice looking QR code. 
all data is anonymous um, unless you um, want to submit your name for a follow-up, um, then you just need to provide an email. Everyone got it? You have access to the slides. <laughs> Anyways, um, so anyways, um, some other stuff. So I'm going to be talking about this more at the end of the meeting. We are kind of changing things up. Tool time is going to be after the general talk because um, I want a bit more flexibility um, in asking questions and stuff. But the full cast Sunshine CTF, we're looking for challenge creators. Um, I don't care if you have absolutely no experience. I just want like a large diverse group of people who have very good amount of experience um, to help us make great challenges. Um, and I'll be talking a lot more about this um, at, like after the main talk. Anyways, um, we're now gonna have Jackson come up and do current events. All right, current events this week. What do we got first? Oh yes, firm attack. So Vermont was some mathematician, basic history, you don't really need to know. You've probably seen the equation. So RSA key encryption, every RSA key is created using algorithm that mainly just uses an N that is then thrown through the whole hash, whatever, and that gives you your main key, right? That number N there. So what has happened was there, there has been a discovery where if your N, how that's generated is generated really close together, the numbers that are used to create it, you can brute force using basic algebra to brute force any RSA encryption key, just snap right through it. So if basic math, N is equal to A squared plus B squared, which is A plus B, A minus B. So N, which is your unhashed key, is made of two prime numbers, which is going to be P and Q, and associating out in math again. So in RSA key creation, let's assume that P and Q are very close together. Like let's say P is a prime number and then in math, Q is the very next prime number after P. You generate N using N times P. You can get the difference of that, which allows you to kind of brute force figure out what N is because the difference between P and Q is most likely gonna be the difference of a few thousand, which is actually relatively small in RSA key encryption. So you, it's a lot easier to do that. A lot of other math. Very different way. Uh, this isn't a very notorious way to break RSA keys because this is only true if the key is generated very improperly. Example being the bottom here. Like you get a first number X and then it's gonna go find the first prime number after that, which is P. Then after P it's gonna go with the next prime number. So the program is generating you an N that is right next to each other. It's, it's deliberately doing that. It's not how they're made usually, but very good exploit known as CVE-2022-26320. Uh, what else have we got? The Alberbot malware returns as Escobar. This was a banking Trojan that came out July, 2021. Usually very good at just throwing up a phishing link to you. Just input your credit, your uh, login credentials, steal that, start draining bank accounts. Uh, it has reemerged about a week or two, uh, week or two ago. Now it's able to steal uh, Google multi-factor authentication codes. So there's a lot more in your bank now at stake, even though it's probably the biggest thing you're concerned about. But, and it's also very efficient against Android operating systems. Haven't seen anything really about it affecting iOS. So you're probably safe for now, not much longer. And one more thing, Co a common NPM package was edited recently to immediately wipe hard drives in certain locations around the globe. So Node IPC, common package used in a lot of Java, JavaScript, right? Enables interprocess communication. Designated CDE 2022-23812. On March 7th, the maintainer of this package, forget his name, deliberately introduced malicious code to the package, where upon if you ran anything that you utilized this package, would use your IP address, geolocate where you were. And if you were located in Russia or Belarus, it would wipe your hard drive. Everything is gone. There's just, 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 just because in protest, it explicitly, they did that the maintainer did it. They fixed it after about 10 hours, but he reintroduced a new protest method. 
he introduced a new dependency to Node IPC known as Peace Not War, which instead of just deleting everything on your system, it would introduce a text file that was protesting violence in the Ukraine Russia conflict right now. Yes. So, question. If Let's say hypothetically you were running a VPN that had an ex <laughs> in Russia, uh, and then you ran said uh, infected module. Would that completely wipe your hard drive? Most likely, I would say so. Yeah, yeah that sounds like a great idea. It's a great. I don't know. I don't know why you'd really be running a VPN out of Russia instead of somewhere like Sweden. But if you want to do Russia, feel free. <laughs> it was a, it was a rather interesting. Box, uh, VPN to run how you social media. <laughs> <laughs> All right, not saying anyone should do that, but you can get into Twitter. All right, so now we have Where Are They Now by Carlos Beltran. Hey. Yeah, uh, new to this format, so no idea what we're doing here. Um, my name's Carlos. I uh, used to be at UCF back in 2015. Uh, was president of uh, Hack UCF for a while. Uh, so thanks for everything you're doing. Uh, ran uh, the uh, CCDC group. We got two time national champs. I think afterwards, I actually went over to HEC. I saw you guys have a crap ton of flags. You guys have been fucking killing it. Uh, also, Tom, you have a bigger trophy case now. I do. <laughs> uh, I was at UCF, at, I think, seven years ago, if my math's right. And I think that place used to be the venue chief. And now, yes, yeah, <laughs> shiny thing. It's got the Alamo Cup. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, I uh, went to school for IT, uh, for the minor secure computing and networking. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I had a lot more uh, success with the club than I did with my degree. Uh, the degree, the certification that you see up there, they're, they're useful, right? They, they, they pass the HR background check, but at the end of the day, it's the connections you make here. That's the thing that's most important. Um, yeah, I uh, worked at, I was in the army uh, before I went to, to UCF. Uh, did eight years there, did uh, information insurance, so basically cybersecurity there before it was a big deal. Uh, worked at GuidePoint Security, I think some of you guys are probably familiar with the local group there. Uh, worked at Citibank as an internship. Went to Amazon, worked on their security incident response team uh, for about two years, crying at my desk. And uh, I learned a lot about APT attacks. You know, you hear about them all the damn time, you hear about CDEs and stuff, and then you go to a major company that's owning literally half the fucking internet, and you realize these attacks are serious. Um, and uh, the people who are de the defenders, the blue teams, those are the ones who suffer the most. Uh, you are up at 2 a.m., uh, getting paged all the damn time. And uh, you go home tired every night, but that good kind of tired. You're just like, damn, I made a big difference. I made a huge impact. Um, I need to go to sleep, but this is good. You, you, you learn very, very quickly. Uh, when Snapchat secured the nudes, uh, worked at Bird, a scooter company. I think you guys use Spin here. What the fuck is that about? Um, <laughs> but, uh, I guess. The um the company that just sells cycling nine body as um, models. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bird's actually pretty cool about that. We actually have our own R and D facility and everything. We I don't even work there anymore. Uh, but uh, yeah, they have uh like their own R and D facility. They're trying to do like battery technology and stuff. It's pretty freaking cool. But yeah, we've always used to trash on the other ones who are just reselling cycles. Um, but yeah, Snapchat worked on uh infrastructure security, trying to be more proactive. Bird, same thing, ran the security operations team or the security team in general. And now we're at threat key. Um doing cool stuff there. We'll talk about that later though. Uh questions. So if you could disclose it, what was your uh like one major moment uh at Amazon Fifteen? The one that like sticks on the most. Oh man, I was just thinking about this actually. Uh I accident okay, so you know how you guys are familiar with like bug bounty programs and stuff like that, right? So Amazon at the time were it's gonna sound kind of weird because like it's like not junior, but it's junior, uh, in the sense that Amazon's like 25 years old. Uh, but we had a fairly nascent uh, uh, bug bounty program. Effectively, the vulnerabilities come in through security at Amazon.com. And one of my responsibilities was actually to maintain that inbox. Uh, I accidentally deleted the whole thing. <laughs> every single vulnerability, every single full disclosure, every single embargoed vulnerability that we were coming in found, believe the whole damn thing. That was fucked up. Uh, <laughs> uh, was able to recover it in a few hours, uh, thanks to some backups, but Jesus, that was not a fun night. And then I had to explain to my boss, just like, hey, you know, John, full disclosure, I'm sorry, uh, but everything's going to be back in, in time in a couple hours, like it fucking better be. Uh, but yeah, that, that was a big lesson to learn. 
Um, realistically, the thing to learn from that was mistakes happen uh, and make sure you plan for it, right? Um, uh, hell, I work at Thrifty right now. And one of the big things is uh, uh, production sometimes goes down. You know, you, you push bad code. Uh, it's okay to make mistakes. Just be ready to roll back. Yeah. Yeah. Carlos, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you get your internships and then once you get at Amazon, how you start moving from one company to the next? Yeah, sure. Uh, how I got my internships. Uh, so I guess my first bit was at GuidePoint Security. Uh, GuidePoint, uh, I don't know if they still do, but they had a pretty close relationship with Hack CF back in the day. Uh, GuidePoint is a boutique cybersecurity firm uh, based out of Tampa. Uh, I think John Singer still works there, uh, doing cool stuff. But uh, yeah, they, uh, they reached out uh, to me and a few other people and they're like, hey, you wanna do some cool stuff, uh, basically offensive attacks. Uh, I got to be a red teamer. I got to hack into national laboratories. Uh, I've seen other people on the team got to break into uh, physical assessments, break into hotels and things like that. Uh, one of the cool things is uh, I got to go to uh, my boss's house in Colorado for about a week, Andrew Johnson. And he just basically, for 24 hours straight, we were hacking away at that national lab. Uh, we ended up getting in, so that was awesome. Um, but I also I learned how like five days of nonstop offensive hacking, uh, how that affects you and how you learn extremely quickly. Uh, he taught me a lot about exploit development and uh, uh, pivoting, never pivoting in attacks. Um, he also explained, you know, how you get out of jail, you know, uh, <laughs> not out of like prison, but like, you know, you get out of jail free card uh, in case you do, you know, get in trouble. Um, a city, uh, I actually took a different approach. I went on the blue team. Uh, I worked uh, on a lot of uh, policy procedures, things like that. Went over to Fort Lauderdale City, learned how to hack into an ATM machine. Uh, and that was also a lot of fun. Uh, you got a bunch of, uh, you know, SANS uh, instructors effectively teach you just how to break into an ATM machine that's running fucking Windows XP uh, or embedded at that time. Um, yeah, uh, career progression. Uh, Went to Amazon. Amazon I got from uh, from CCDC, from Nationals. Uh, National CCDC is a really great opportunity to just get your exposure out there. It's effectively a two, three day uh, interview, right? Where you're just constantly hammering away at things. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, answer? Yeah, I was gonna say, but I know you've worked with a lot of our alumni and stuff. In fact, you might want to talk about the FireEye offer and how you pass it off to another team member. Your internship with Joe? Uh, yeah, Joe Page. Yeah. Um, one of the big things is when you get out of Hack UCF, uh, if you play your cards right, if you if you network properly, like you're gonna make some lifelong friendships here. Uh, hell, I started. I, I'm actively at a startup right now with a bunch of Hack UCF alumni. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I had an offer from FireEye. I had an offer from Amazon. And uh, I don't know. Do you guys want me to say numbers? I can say numbers. What do you guys want? I don't know. Sure. Yeah, everyone's shaking their head. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, at Amazon, uh, I actually got a, a low offer, uh, $88,000 uh, starting base. Uh, and then at uh, FireEye, it was about 100 k I ended up taking the Amazon offer instead of, I think that's some cool boots. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I ended up taking the Amazon offer over in uh, Seattle instead of uh, the DC offer at FireEye, just because the, the work was more engaging to me. I felt more connected and felt more uh, like I was making a positive impact. Um, obviously, this was before Amazon, like everyone peeing at bottles and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, at least in the security side of it, it was, it was a little different, um, just a little, but yeah, honestly, uh, I, I think we're all in a really great position, uh, in cybersecurity or even in technology that we have, we have the privilege, the opportunity to choose the things that we want to do that make work, not actually work. You get to do the things that you want to do and you don't really have to worry about, and I, I understand this is an extremely privileged statement to say, but, uh. It's awesome that you don't have to worry about finances. You can focus on your own personal career uh, appreciation, enjoy yourself. You should only be in security if you're actually enjoying it. Make sure the money's nice, absolutely. But after a while, you get to do the fun stuff. Uh, I actually got trolled on 4chan once. Uh, <laughs> oh man, do you guys know about this story? Uh, so we uh, uh, we won, I think, nationals right after, right very recently. I think it was the first time. And uh, the local news station for Orlando came through and they wanted to interview us in uh, the 362. Um, and uh, they brought the cameras out and stuff like that. We did a whole uh, 
uh, demonstration with me, like market orders, and everyone's like typing away, you know, C matrix and shit like that. Um, but uh, at one point, they had a little talk down, and uh, they're asking me all these different questions, like, oh, why cybersecurity? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's like the sexy, nerdy kind of thing of technology, right? And uh, I think 4chan got like one of those like half frame grabs of me, like, making a stupid face. And they're like, oh, look, it's sexy and nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, uh, that was great. Um, post their IP. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, great text. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, had a lot of fun. What else? Uh, which of those jobs is your favorite and why? Hmm. Uh, they're all pretty fun, honestly. When I worked at Snapchat, uh, it was cool. Uh, I got to. Uh, I got to come back to America, but I guess I should talk about that. Amazon, uh, I worked in Seattle for a bit, and then I moved over to Ireland uh, to help stand up their, uh, their uh, it's a response side on that side of things. Uh, I got to come back to America for a, a nice, a healthy pay raise, uh, and I got to work with friends again, right? More alumni. Um, I learned a lot more about being more proactive and preventative in your security posture. Uh, I learned that you don't have to be paged three times a night. I learned that things can be relaxing if you, just like with your healthcare, be more proactive in seeing the doctor and making sure you reduce your security footprint effectively. Um, I think I've loved all my jobs so far. Uh, so far. Uh, Thrifty's really nice. Uh, working with effectively friends that I've known for three years now. Uh, but I've, I've loved them all. I know it's kind of a cheesy answer, cop out, but I don't know. You, if, you're, if you don't enjoy the work you're doing, get the fuck out. So, what helped me learn the most? Uh, what you guys were just doing earlier about the CVEs, uh, tool time and things like that. Uh, staying late up, uh, staying up incredibly late at night, uh, thanks to Tom allowing us to keep us uh, late at HSC and stuff, and just hacking away, uh, doing CTS, uh, learning about various different vulnerabilities and executing them, right? Uh, it's more than just book work, it's the actual hands-on experience that really helps you just expand your, your knowledge base, whether it's infrasec, corpsec, appsec, reverse engineering, vulnerability management, anything. Just dive in and get hands-on keyboard effectively. It's cool. Wanna tell us a little bit about what you got going on? Uh, sure. So right now I, uh, I have a lot of sleepless nights over at ThreatKey. Uh, ThreatKey.com. I'm the CTO there and co-founder. Uh, we all basically start, and you can see on the, on the team page, uh, everyone's past names for Mac UCF, but, uh, uh, we all were working at these various different companies, right? Uh, uh, various different things. We got people from Google, from Facebook, SpaceX, uh, uh, currently Snapchat, Google, uh, Microsoft, name drop whatever, um, all these major brands and everyone from Mac UCF kind of said the same thing. We keep going to these new companies. We keep doing the same thing, right? Uh, we kept just rebuilding the same tools. The big, the biggest difference between our alerts and our tooling was just the domain was, domain name was different. So that's got to change because all these big name companies are able to do security and because they can afford it. Uh, but these smaller companies can't do it. So we want to democratize preventative security. Um, so we've been focusing on that. Initially, it was just nights and weekends, just fucking around with Kubernetes and things like that. And then Google found out about us, and they gave us, we'll say, an offer we couldn't refuse um, that made us all quit our day jobs and work full time, um, which was very, very nice. Um, it's allowed us to really focus on just building out more preventative, proactive security controls. Uh, Something I've learned throughout the years is that a lot of security tools, a lot of vendors are just bullshit, right? They, they fire off alarms for no reason because they want you to feel like, hey, I'm, I'm getting ROI, return on investment, right? Uh, if I got an alarm and I woke up my, my SOC team, I must be paying, uh, using the money well spent. You think that we should only be firing off on, on no false positives, only true positives, things that are real, things that are actionable. And in the future, we actually uh, are actively building out a model that we can programmatically determine if we can programmatically remediate vulnerabilities without any human interaction. Uh, and we feel like we're very, very close to that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I guess closing words, unless you guys have any other questions. Uh, keep it hacky stuff. The fact that you guys have 501c3 is fucking huge. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, the fact that this, this 
this team, this group is growing. That's huge. Um, I don't know. Maybe Tom earmuffs or something right now, but skip class. Go to Hacky CF. <laughs> Hacky CF is, is it's, it's the connections, the networks, the friendships you're going to make. Even if you don't talk to the person to your left and right, uh, it's, it's how you're going to accelerate your career. Uh, yeah. Carlos, uh, we had uh, John Haas visit us by Zoom last semester or earlier this semester as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm just trying to double check. I know you're working with him right now. Yeah. Um, you actually graduated before, at least before you joined our CCDC team. Do you know him from school at all? John? Yeah. Uh, John used to go to uh, some of the, uh, he was an attendance member. Okay. I just remember you, you were on the team by the time he joined us on the team. So that's yeah. what I'm how, you know, how the relationship. Yeah. John, John was part of Hacky CF in the early days. He was with Prince and all that, right? Uh, and then he went to go change careers halfway through college. And he went to go, I think, go get a medical degree or something like that. And he changed back in and it's just back and forth. But uh, now he's a uh, he's a turkey. The psychogenetic or the cyber type one. So do you guys feel like threat teaming or is it more like, uh, like risk management? Uh, neither. So it's more preventative, right? So a uh, common example, let's say you have an AWS environment uh, and you have various different resources exposed, right? You have public S3 buckets or crap like that. Um, you know, a, a, a posture management tool might just say, hey, that bucket's public, it's probably internal to it, right? What we want to do is say, hey, that bucket's public, and we've actually analyzed and assessed it. Uh, we see the inbound events, the, the authenticated calls to it. We can see that they're all authenticated and all internalized. So you can easily, without affecting your business continuity, go ahead and internalize it. No, no risk on you. If you click this button, it'll take care of it for you. In fact, if it reverts back because the developer accidentally exposes something terrible and stuff like that, we'll tell you who done it and give them the opportunity to explain why they did it and just keep maintaining uh, that reversion so we have regression monitor effectively. Um, yeah, we're targeting things like Okta, GitHub, uh, Microsoft 365, the list is on the site. Um, but yeah, that's the idea, right? Uh, historically, uh, for most companies, what they do is you're going to learn that so security a lot of it is oftentimes paperwork uh they do like quarterly assessments pci SOC 2 iso 27001 all those kind of compliance measurements uh they mandate that you do either quarterly or annual assessments we say fuck that why why check some why check if something's vulnerable every 90 days let's just check every couple of seconds yeah. Yeah. easy enough cool thank you So that's the second time that we've heard about threat key. I think we're gonna have to have them back for a, uh, a full meeting one of these days. All right, I'd like to welcome Chris Fisher up to tell us a little bit about uh, vulnerability researching and zero day engineering. You go. Do this, fire screen. Oh, yes, the thing. Slides, 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 slides. I'm going to say slides like some of the times in the appointment. Slides. Oh, no. The slides. Wait, why is it not doing the slides? Slides? Slides. You know, I don't know why Zoom broke. Did Zoom break? <laughs> we're we're at we're at the slides moment right now, guys. This is this is a real slide moment. It's, it broke. Hi, Jeffrey. Bump, bump. Let's try this screen. Okay. No. Oh yeah, wait. It takes a bit. Especially from UCF Wi-Fi. Yeah, I blame UCF. I feel like that's like the most reasonable answer here. Yeah, I, well, I feel like I'm at this point rather committed to not being on WPA2. It should be on WPA2. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to try it one more time. If you really want, I can. If you send me the slides, I could add them to the other presentation. You can refresh. I could do that. I might have to do that. That's unfortunate. Hmm. Do you have demos on your computer? 
Oh, we don't need to do that today. That's fine. We'll work around that. Um, yeah, I will send the slides to you. It's interesting because it says that I'm screen sharing. I'm not. Oh, someone's talking on the Zoom, I think. Is it? Yeah. Just switch to Microsoft Teams. <laughs> we, We're a nonprofit now. We can do it on our own. Yeah. You know, you make a fair point. All right. All right. Send you the slides? Yeah, or is there an HDMI cord? There should be. Yes, there should be. There is. You will still have to share on Zoom, though. Yeah. You make a fair point. All right. Yeah, I'll send you my slides. Give me like 30 seconds. Addison, what's your name on Discord again? Um, the real question yeah. is how many people in the Discord are on the Zoom are also in this room physically? Quite a few, probably. Yeah. Probably a third of it. Half of them heard me muttering slides to myself a few times. <laughs> what? Uh, well, Jeffrey, why don't you, uh, you getting slides sent over? Um, do you want to maybe detail a little bit about what you're going to talk about later on? Um, sure, I, I guess I can fill up the space. Um, I don't have my slide deck ready, but. Um, is it like, the, are you making your own slide deck as well? Or I do have my own slide deck. At least this is the PowerPoint. Okay, you can switch forward like literally one time. Um, yeah, go for it. Okay, I guess we're changing the order. Um, do you push forward know. once? Um, do you want to? It's okay. Yeah. So it looks like um, we're going to be doing tool time. I was going to do it after the main talk, but you see, now the tool talk after the main talk, um, that joke does not land anymore. Um, also, um, thanks to folks at Sunshine for sponsoring this talk. And by that, I mean I'm talking on their behalf. Um, anyways. Let's talk about um, capture the flags. Um, this is going to be mostly an opinion piece. I adapted parts of this talk from a live overflow video. I think that's the correct URL. I could be mistaken. Um, this is I, a terrible YouTube video. Yeah. Um, like, I, I, you might have said it in a different video. I think that was a video, eh, whatever. Um, anyways, I also want this to be an open conversation. One of the reasons why I wanted to be at the end of the talk so we can have some QA. We can still do a Q&A after um, Chris is done talking about. So capture the flags are probably one of the easiest ways to practice your fiber skills without, you know, breaking the law. Um, like there are other tools, of course, like I think tools like Hack the Box are probably more valuable than something like ha Capture the Flag. But Capture the Flags, they have a little barrier entry um, relatively um, when you compare it to some more of the um, like strictly offensive stuff. Um, and even like, having an opportunity to get involved, um, involved with some of the blue team stuff. So um, I'm going to be talking about, like, in my observation, what makes a CTF fun and what makes a CTF anything but fun. So first, good challenges are accessible. That means that the players um, playing the competition, they are actually able to solve it. You're not going to be putting something behind a paywall or requiring that they have a copy copy of like um like cobalt strike like no, no one's gonna have that especially if they know nothing like if you um have something that you require make it either free open source software or somehow provide like a license to access it this applies for both tooling and knowledge if you have like a technical specification um please don't get it from like um, iso because I believe they have paywalls on most of their specs. Um, second, um, novel challenges, in my experience, are usually more fun than the ones that have been done over and over again. Like, we all know we have the basic pwns. Like, maybe you have, a, like, a basic XSS um, for web. But, like, these challenges that have been done over and over again by different, like, CTFs, they get boring after a while. Um, on, like, the very, like, experience side, they become busy work, just something you have to like do quickly, just be on top of the scoreboard. But if you're someone who's brand new, um, I'd say it's arguably worse because you can literally just Google the answer and get the exact same challenge right up and just solve it verbatim. One of the greatest things about Capture the Flag, they kind of stimulate like the part of your brain that critically thinks. Like you have to solve a puzzle because CTF challenges are puzzles. And if you, find a shortcut to not go through that um, puzzle solving process, what's the point? You might as well just read write-ups all day. And speaking of reading write-ups all day, um, 
CTFs should be educational. You should come out of the challenge, whether you solve it or not, coming out with something. You might have not found the exact solution to the challenge, but maybe you actually learned something about some like tech that you've never messed with before, or maybe just something about something you do work with on a daily basis, but now we can see it from a brand new light. In short, CTFs are educational. And if you have something that doesn't like fulfill that requirement, it's not as fulfilling as a challenge than it could be. Now I'm gonna talk about some things that make CTFs not good. Um, guessiness. There's, a, there's been those challenges where you might have attempted and you're like, what was the author thinking? How, like that idea, you have to think like the author in order to solve the challenge. When I'm designing challenges, I like to think of the opposite, or I should. Um, think of what will the player think of? What might they do first to be able to solve this challenge? Like a lot of times, one of the first things that come to a person's head is find something unique about the tech stack and just Google it. But if it requires very specific keywords, then it doesn't work. As a good example of a guessy challenge are most stego challenges, because there are a lot of steganography tools. You got open stego, you got the digital invisible ink toolkit, um, you got stego veritas, you have like like even some obscure ones for like um, like GIF encoding, you have stego for audio. Like you might be able to take this giant list and narrow it down by a vast amount, but sometimes you cannot and then you're just stuck. That's why if you're gonna do something like a stego challenge, you need to kind of lead them to the tool that you want them to use, but don't handhold them. You just kind of want to give them a small little nudge in the right direction so they feel like they're accomplishing something without just telling them, yeah, you stack solve. Um, second, bad CTF challenges are repetitive. I don't see this that often. Usually, if a CTF challenge is repetitive, it's intentionally so. Um, that is, like, you might have something you have to solve 200,000 times. A human can't do that, but a script can. And that is the um, kind of the premise of a lot of scripting challenges. Um, Sunshine CTF has had many. There's actually some on ctf.hackucf.org, if I'm not mistaken. And recently, NCAE Cyber Games had some scripting challenges as well. Um, the challenge archetype of you have to do this problem 100,000 times, and then you get to the answer. Like, that's fine. But if you have it, something that you have to do it 10 times, something that wouldn't warrant the effort of writing a script to do it, then that's just, just boring. And then finally, frustrating challenges are no good. You want to make people's gears turn, but you don't want to grind their gears. So in other words, you want to have them actually feel like they're critically engaging with the challenge and actually put, like interested and engaged with your um, challenge. But you don't want to turn them off. You don't want them to be like, oh, this is stupid. Like, why am I wasting my time? This is, you don't want them to be frustrated. And I think one thing that people usually forget is that CTF challenges are games. That's actually the theme of our um, next B-Sides. It's gonna be, um, um, or our next Sunshine. It's gonna be games because, well, CTF challenges, that's all they are at the end of the day. Good game design principles, like, like tutorial. Like I have Mario 1-1 one, one because this is probably one of the most um, like beautiful levels uh, because you have to know how to walk forward and then like maybe you'll try jumping um, under that box. And like the design of the level itself helps you learn how to play. A CTF challenge should be the same. It should kind of push you to pull that right arrow button and they accelerate forward or to jump, maybe in a place you didn't think to jump before, like maybe jump here and here, um, which can have different effects. And also can tell you like, maybe when you're doing something wrong and have some feedback that way. Um, maybe if you go down a rabbit hole, instead of just wasting hours of your time, maybe have some mechanism in that challenge that is like you hitting a Goomba and it tells you, hey, maybe, Try something else. Um, so yeah, all this is kind of a prelude to say 
Sunshine CTF is looking for challenge creators. Um, I presented some of the things that we look for for game design, but um, even if you aren't familiar with some of those principles, maybe you've never played a CTF before, or maybe you've never designed a CTF before, that's fine. Like when I started um, making challenges for Sunshine, I think I partake um, in like one, two CTFs at that time, but you don't exactly need that experience to make a good challenge. It helps immensely. And I'd say over the past year, I've um, improved a lot in the challenge making regard, but like it's not strictly necessary. Additionally, we have people come up to us and say, hey, I don't think I have what it takes to be a challenge creator. I'm not going to make an impossibly cha um, challenging challenge. Like, sure, we have some people on the team who have literally made an assembly language. You don't have to do that. You can do something as basic as like maybe a new approach on the classic um, like buffer overflow tone, um, except with some theming. Maybe you want to try something that is like the next level off of that. Maybe you just want to do something fun, um, whether it's like strictly cybersecurity or not. We had some people from Talfade, um, Kidathal, um, am I getting that right? Um, come up to us and say, hey, we're an engineering fraternity. We want to help. And our response was, yeah, that would be awesome because like engineering is like something that does come in the cyber formula. Maybe not explicitly, but when you have to deal with stuff like, like industrial control systems, like that is important. And that's kind of where like cybersecurity and engineering kind of bridge. And that might be some fertile ground for a challenge. So like the different perspectives and diversity of thought is definitely appreciated there. And of course, you can't really get that without having like everyone being able to protect. And to facilitate that, a um, bit of a teaser, um, we're gonna be running a Sunshine CTF Challenge Creation Hackathon. So we're currently looking at April 5th, either 7 or 8 p.m. We haven't worked it out exactly. Um, anyone is welcome. If you are in Nightcaps, say a towel, hack UCF, we wanna see you and we wanna help you create challenges. Um, like great about doing it in kind of like a hackathon like environment is we can get a lot of challenges written really quickly, as well as getting those challenges play tested in the room as they're being developed and be able to talk to peers to be like, hey, is this fun to you? Or like, hey, I have this problem. How do you think I should approach it? And being able to bounce ideas off of other people in the room. Further details will be announced. Um, including if we decide to do prizes, it'll probably be like t-shirts and some stuff we have in the lab, so nothing too fancy. But like, we'd love to like kind of have a lot of people um, come out and just bang out some challenges and um, see what is in those heads of yours. So yeah, um, here's the operation slide. Um, Chris, um, you good? What? Enjoy the party cards. Yeah, I'm close out of this real fast. Yes. It will just be replacing I think it is Chris we are talking. Yes. So we found out that my slides don't like to play with Google slides. And if you have any questions, I'll be asking at the end of Chris's talk. Or you can just um, DM me on Discord to check up. So, um, without further ado. Yep, here we are. All right. Slides. 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 Hold up. Hold up. That's that's a lot more that's a lot more bold than I'm prepared to be. Slides. All right. Cool. Um, I am going to. Um, you're not screen sharing. Oh. Let's play my favorite game. Why does why does uh, screen share? I don't have access to that. Thank you. All right, we are about it at time, but Jeffrey, I know that uh, you had a little bit of QA session that you want to roll through. You want to do that I before do that. we get into this? Um. So yeah. Um. Anyone. I know it's been like about like an hour um, since I kind of 
was doing that. Um, anyone have any questions about um, capture the flag by um, challenge design? What is system software? <laughs> Uh, this one guy might be able to answer this question. It's like something on tag. Um, I, 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 I'd give him an email. Can you define Matt OS? <laughs> Matt, the Matthew Matt operating Matt. system, also known as Matt OS, is a proprietary operating system um, created and designed by Matthew McKeever. <laughs> I-42. I-42. Um, Wait, what year is it? It's 2022. Um, ask again in like 50 years. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Is Matt OS used in any common software that we might use today? Yes. What's the internet? Yes. Like? <laughs> How much does it cost to get an enterprise license with Matt OS? Let's talk to you about that. <laughs> Question over here. It's completely fine. This is totally serious Q and A. How is styrofoam made? <laughs> Good question. Next. <laughs> um, you can ask questions in CTF. <laughs> what? What is this in software? <laughs> oh. I don't know how to make styrofoam in the capture the flag competition. I'm sorry. What happens when you combine kerosene and styrofoam? <laughs> Bad things. Okay, Vaguely known as napalm. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do we have any like CTF creation related questions? Yeah. <laughs> like what this QA is supposed to actually be about. I guess um, um, Jake scrub out that QA session. Thank you. I don't know how mature Matt OS is. <laughs> Matt, if you want, you can make a Matt OS CTF challenge for Sunshine. Yeah, what's a GitHub repo? It's private. So, um, <laughs> there you go. I'm expecting Matt OS by the end of the day. And what is St. P? St. Petersburg? St. P, the newsletter. St. P. St. <laughs> um, Patrick's Day. Um, I don't know why, but apparently MailChimp thought it would be a hilarious thing to just cut out the sentence. I swear it's not like time for that fail. How late is the workshop going? Um, I have key access, so it can go as long as I want it to go. Um, 4 a.m. So realistically, thing is, I'm thinking a seven to an eleven. Um, I yet to get the actual like time slot cleared. Um, but yeah, probably like just as late as CCDC. Yeah, the idea on this right here is because most of the other uh, like clubs and or groups and or like the engineering fraternity, they weren't able to meet on weekends when we typically do workshops. They'd only meet during the week. Um, this is usually our time for an ops meeting. We're going to scrub an ops meeting just to make time for this. So if you have time to come check it out, you definitely should. If you know someone in another engineering major or in any other major that has this time slot open and wants to come create like really cool challenges, like this is where it's all at. Like we've got Hack the Port coming up, right? This is where we're gonna be gone all next week, the, the majority of the execs at least. We're going down to Fort Lauderdale to like hack a marina, like to try to facilitate a bunch of like chaos in simulated like real world stuff. There's a uh, similar for like airports, hack the airport. There's hack a sat, which is uh, at DEF CON, I think every year where you actually have to like interface with satellites and simulate reaching out uh, with software-defined radio and hitting computer hardware that's like in orbit. Now you wouldn't think that that's much of a problem, but when you've got something that's moving really, really fast, the last thing you want it to do is move really, really fast in the wrong direction. Cause that's a lot of people's problems. And you know, people can do that. It's hacking can be lots and lots of things. Half, if half the difficulty is being able to interface with it, you only have so long before someone can like weaponize that. And that's why it's important to get cross disciplinary skills. I thought I saw a hand up somewhere. Yeah, cool. What is that, the Air Force? Um, it is, I believe, officially called the um, AI SAC, um, like CTF. Um, I believe it's in the fall. I don't remember exactly when in the fall. But yeah, that challenge was fun. For this CTF, so if we do attend this, um, I know we talked about it, but um, how is, like, are you going to be prevented from playing the CTF? Okay, so I think what's most likely going to be the case, and thank you for asking. Um, Anag asked, 
if you are um, like partaking this challenge hackathon or submit a challenge, are you barred from playing the CTF? I think what we want to say is you will not be barred from partaking the CTF as a whole, but you will not be allowed to solve your challenge. However, if you make enough challenges that we actually add you to our private GitHub repository, we will have to take you off the scoreboard um, because then it is at the point where you literally have a list of every single flag. That is not fun and that like you're not going to cheat, but you, you know too much. To clarify, you can still do the CTF, you just can't. You can't get the belt. Else? I don't think so. Um, if anyone wants to ask any other questions um, that are serious or not, um, you can ask me during the workshop or ask me on Discord. Um, and yeah, thank you for the um, totally serious questions. Right. Operations usually Tuesdays at eight. We're getting to the end of the semester, so uh, if you haven't joined already, you should at least come check it out. Maybe you find something you want to do. Uh, I got nothing else to talk about on uh, projects. We did talk about Sunshine CTF planning. If you're not on the mailing list, you're on the mailing list. If you have a visitor shop, why not? Buy a t-shirt. Uh, if you're not on Discord, you definitely should be. And if you do the Twitter thing, so do we. Thank you for coming to Hack UCF. We really appreciate you guys coming here. If you have any questions, please come up to the front. Otherwise, have a great weekend. And I hope to see you at the workshop on Saturday to do lock picking and potentially some uh, breaking into cardboard boxes. Cool. Have a good one, y'all. It's actually, I just realized I'm going to actually on my desktop. I'm going to use it like over here. I'm just sitting there.